Hey everybody, this is Brother Frank, and glad to be here with you tonight. This will be an important program. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, help me um, say the right things, Lord, to be led by your Spirit. And Lord, I repent personally when I have not lived up to your calling. But Lord, I pray tonight that you would accept my plea for forgiveness, because I ask it in the name of Yeshua. And I ask, Lord, that you would cleanse me. And, the, and you would lead me in the ways of righteousness and this audience, Lord, that we would be pleasing in your sight through these last days of earth's history, that we may finish the work that you have called us to in Jesus name. Amen. Well, the reason tonight is important is because the deception is growing so intensely. And I want to share um, from a, one of the dreams of Demetri Dudeman, because when I read it, it it's so important. It's so real. And, and you know these things, but I want you to hear it uh, again, and I want you to absorb it. But folks, we got to understand right now that if you're not making any preparations spiritually, first and foremost, getting your life straightened out with God, getting you serious about everything, then you know what? Nothing else matters. But after that, it's time to put some food away if you can. You know, I understand if you can't afford it, we're not to live in fear, but we are to live in accordance to wisdom. And God gives us wisdom on what to do. He gives, he gave people plans in the Bible, how to prepare just like Joseph and everything. And listen, I understand some people just do not have the money and that's okay. But I'm telling you right now, you can afford a bag of rice, a very big bag of rice, and you can afford a bag of dry beans. And you can store them appropriately for very, very cheap. Do you know how long you can live on rice and beans alone for a very long time? Put away some water, you know, those kind of things. These are things that are affordable that anybody can do. Uh, that is not outrageous. You don't have to go spend thousands and thousands of dollars. Listen, if you want to know a way to get rice at a cheap way, then find in your area if there is an oriental market or a foreign market, go in there and buy your rice from there. These are people that eat tons of rice and you can buy big, huge bags for so much cheaper uh, many times in normal grocery stores. At least it seems what the experience, uh, as far as I understand it, my wife does more of that stuff. Beans, all those things, because people from other countries, they eat that a lot more than us in America. We like everything canned, ready to go, Uncle Ben style. Um, so, you know, this is a good, easy, practical way because the leader of this country is saying there's going to be food shortages. They're telling you there's a new world order. You know, I remember when George Bush Sr. first talked about the NWO. Everybody had a mental breakdown, right? This is conspiracy. This is what the Bible's talking about. Here it is, blah, blah, blah. Well, now they're saying it every day and they don't care that you know that there's go this, this is coming. They're telling you that they are trying to start a new world order. Folks, I don't know what else needs to be said. Now, here's the other side of the story. Everything that's predominantly being saying for the most part today is a lie, whether it's about the countries that are at war, whether it's about our state, the things they say about Russia, China, the things they say about um, Ukraine, the things they say about the United States. Listen, there's folks, there is so much lies and disinformation out there it's very difficult to decipher what is truth and what is error. And that's okay because our livelihood is not based on the world's news. Now, it is an indicator and it does help us to check the temperature of the crisis of the world of what's going on. But our primary focus is to be on upon our God and allow him. And I want to speak specifically to those that are afraid of what's going on right now. You're worried. Brother Frank, I don't have the money to prepare. Brother Frank, I don't have this. Listen, first of all, stop worrying about that. Stop worrying. If you are afraid right now, it's okay. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that everybody's perfect. We've all been in fearful situations. That's just an indicator that you need to find perfect love because perfect love casteth out all fear. And if you're deathly afraid right now, I want you to do something. Stop, turn this stuff off, and confess to God that you're very afraid. Ask the Father 
to pass that peace that passes all understanding onto you. Ask him to help you receive it because in all truth, he's already given it. So ask him, Lord, how do I receive this peace? I sound like I'm contradicting myself, but really in all reality, he has given it and we need to actually just receive it. Um, and confess that to our heavenly father. His shoulders are big enough. His shoulders can handle the fact that you're afraid. We've all been there. It's okay, but you need to deal with that first. And the only way that I can tell you that you can cast out fear is by accepting and embracing and receiving perfect love. That comes by wholly putting your entire existence in being and focus into your heavenly father. It's that simple. And you're like, Brother Frank, I've tried. You know what? I I want you to honestly, if you're telling me that, I want you to honestly examine your life that you have truly done that. And I'm not talking about for five minutes or here or there when you know, but I'm talking about honestly, when I mean seeking the Father and asking him to receive that peace, you are willing to stick it out more than a couple of minutes or a couple of days or a couple of weeks when you don't receive it right away. But say, Father, I need your guidance right now. I am afraid I need peace. Father, I need this before I can move forward because I don't understand what to do right now and my fear is getting in the way. But I know you've not called me to fear. You have called me to peace. And you can ask the Father to give you or to help you, as I should correct myself again, to help you receive. The Lord said, my peace have I given unto thee. So we want to receive it. And we can ask God to do that. And he will give you his peace so that you can move forward in these last days. Because if you're saved, if you know the Lord, it doesn't matter what happens. It's not exciting. It's not going to be fun necessarily. But it doesn't matter because you are going to be safe and secure in Jesus. And that's what's important. You are witnessing the downfall of a nation. You're witnessing a country that is ripe for the fall. And just looking into some of the things that are just obviously indicators. When a nation falls, you know, it's usually because of, first of all, a loss of values amongst the people, a failure in their economic system. Okay. There is a betrayal and a, and a feeling of a betrayal from their government and a loss of patriotism or, you know, uh, pride, and I don't mean pride in it that way, but uh, you know, uh, in the country that they belong to, and it also begins to grow to a disgruntlement because they don't trust anymore, and ultimately it leads to the fall of a nation. Now, there's a program that I did several years ago back on the Remnant Call. Um, you've got to uh, look it up if you've never heard of it. And it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look it up right now. Um, uh, it is uh, here. We go. Yes, unholy days, the most overlooked sign in the Bible, August twenty fourth, twenty seventeen. You got to go back and hear that program. I talked in depth about the two signs, especially the second one that the Lord talked about that would precede the last days. And stick with me here because I want to get into what Brother Demetri Dudeman said here in just a moment. But, you know, the Lord said, we can already see what's going on in a nation when their economy, when they have more debt than they can pay for, they, they, they don't have any precious metals to back it up. They've fallen in their, act- in their moral fabric of their society. They don't trust their government anymore. There's no unity. You know, there, there's, it's just, and, and another thing that breaks out, and this is a thing you can see in ancient Greece and Rome, and that is... I'll, I'll just to try to keep this program on the air a little bit longer. I'll try to censor a little bit about what I'm saying, but let's just say open effeminate that's going on in the country. Now I like to use a different word, but they get upset with me and you know like to censor what we say on this program. But when you see that lifestyle being lived openly, remember there was two signs Jesus said you will see right before His return. It shall be in the days of Noah. That means every heart or thought of him, every thought of the heart of man was evil. It was wicked. It was, and we are living in that, in that day and age right now. 
there would also be uh, a disregard for the things of God because they're eating and giving, giving in marriage until the flood came and took all the evil away. Now, you also remember that the flood was coming to take the evil away. And remember that the, the bad people were going to get swept up in the flood. And the second sign, which was the days of Lot. And we know that the days of Lot was not only about this lifestyle that's contrary to the word of God, the men who think that they're women and women that think that they're men, and now society openly embracing that. And I just read earlier where some famous uh, star from some, I don't know, is on the news program. She basically made a comment of how long are we going to pretend like these, tra- you know, this trans uh, women are actually men, right? How long are we going to act, or or, excuse me, are not men? You know, how long are we going to pretend that these are not actually men? Got canceled. They, uh, of something that's biologically, scientifically, biblically, a fact of life that you would come out and boldly say the truth that you would be canceled for pointing out something that we all know is fact, That's where we're at. And so the days of Lot were about a sexually depraved society that was so backslidden and living in such a sick way that even when the angels blinded the men that were at the door, they were still clamoring to find the door handle. They were so depraved that even after being blinded, they were still trying to get at them. That is a fallen society that's so dark and so wicked that they'll do anything to fulfill their honestly, the most sickest, deepest sexual desires. That's where we live today in the United States, the chief exporter of this pornography worldwide. And, and we are we are in that moment. So the Bible says those things would precede what's going on. We also know that there will be false messiahs that shall come up in the last days. We see here in the United States, everybody, and, and listen, please get it out of your mind that that means that people are saying that they're Jesus. That's It could be that, but the false Messiah simply means there are those people that are claiming that they are anointed. That's what Messiah means, anointed one. They have the anointing. How many times did you hear the Todd Bentleys and these other you know charismatic preachers, as Brother Benjamin calls them, that are talking about the anointing they have? I was listening to a, a program earlier from a person I... I used to listen to their shows years ago and I got about two or three minutes into it and I realized I was immediately wanted to turn this person off because they said, oh, I'm a been studying prophecy and I know what's up. And, and of course, I've memorized all these things and, and the anointing that, uh, that I have and all the and the and, uh, and the anointing I have or something like that. I said, you know what? I'm done with you. I'm done now. Is there an anointing from the Lord? Absolutely. Can you be in the anointing? Yes. But there's a difference between that and going out and saying, I'm anointed. I don't remember the disciples going out and bragging or the apostles that they had the anointing. Hey, brother, look at me. I have the anointing. No, they knew where it came from. It came from the Lord. And, And folks, We need to understand that there are so many people out there today in ministries that are saying that I'm anointed, that they have the wiz, you know, they have the blessing of God more than anybody else. We also know that that's in in Matthew 24. We also know that in Matthew 24, there's going to be racial wars, you know, ethnos, nation against nation, ethnos against ethnos. There's going to be ethnic racial wars where people are going to hate each other based on their race. That's a biblical thing we always see. And then the big final kicker is in the end of Matthew 24, when it says, when ye shall see all all these things happening at once. You know, the beginning of Matthew starts out and saying, when you show here, knowing that back then when a war happened in a foreign country, when a, something happened in a foreign country, someone had to travel by foot. It took a long period of time. You would finally get the, you would hear about it and you would know that something happened. But then it says in the end of Matthew, it makes a transition and it says, when you can see all all the things happening at once. We are now living in the time when we can now see all of these things happening. And so we know that we are getting so close to the very end. We also know that uh, Revelation 18, that the mighty men of Babylon will deceive the whole world through their pharmacia, through their pharmacy, through their poison. We've just witnessed that. And uh, trust me, they want to keep it going. We see all these things happening. And then we see this 
famine and pestilence and all these things going on that the Bible told us were going to happen. And then we know even more than that, going back to the whole Deuteronomy 28, which is specifically applies to the people of God. You know, there's one thing, the heathen nations and those who do not claim the name of God. But there's another thing when you claim the name of the Lord, we say it in our money, in God we trust. Now, you could say that's a different God. I would say that today that they're not talking about Yahweh, the Lord of the Bible. They're talking about something else. But this nation was founded, whether you like it or not, I don't care what your conspiracy theory was, this nation was founded on a belief in Yahweh, the God of the Bible. And this nation was blessed and we took the gospel into all places of the world. There we were the sending the missionaries out everywhere. The United States helped to try to take the gospel to the very ends of the earth. They did the best they can. But you know the second part of Deuteronomy when it talks about the curses of what happens to God's people when they then turn from the Lord. And the curses are terrible. And now we know that we are ripe for judgment, that all these things in the Bible, and listen, I just I didn't even talk about the tons of more evidence. I'm just hitting a few little tiny things right here. We can go way deeper, but I don't want to go right now because there's something we got to get into. The fact is that we are living in the time that the God told us that this would start to take off and roll and begin to go faster and faster and faster as we begin to see the downfall of not only the U.S., but the entire world. We have to see the downfall of the U.S. Because in order for the everything to finish, and you remember that Jesus is not coming tomorrow. I know some people believe that he's not coming tomorrow. I'm telling you right now, he is not coming tomorrow. Okay. The Bible specifically says there are prophecies that must still be fulfilled before the Lord returns. Now, God can do whatever he feels like doing, but he always sticks to his word because his word is something that he values and he always keeps it. So you know what? You're not going to fly away tomorrow. We have some tough times coming. The good news is, is that the Lord promised to never leave us nor forsake us. Now, I want to get into this dream vision that Brother Demetri Dudeman, listen, you know, you don't hear me read much like this from hardly anybody out there because I don't really believe a lot and I don't really trust a lot of people out there that supposedly have prophecy and different things like this. I do believe, though, Demetri Dudeman was a man who suffered greatly and tremendously for the word of God. And I know those people I've heard him talk about that have seen him could see the scars and all the stuff and the beatings that that man took. It was it was terrible. And I want to read this because it's so important. It's biblically, you're going to recognize this stuff from the Bible, but sometimes hearing it from somewhere else, you know, help helps us to get it through our mind. And it's called a call to war. It was in September of 1993. I'm going to try to read it. It's about two pages long. They're not big pages. They're small pages. But listen to this. Cease heading the way you have been going and turn to me, says the Lord. Lucifer, who is armed for war on his horse, is coming with powerful army behind him to take vengeance against the children of God. The day is close, a day of terror when Lucifer will try to annihilate all those that live a clean life. A day of pain, a terror is near. A day of pain and terror is near. If you could see what is being prepared and what will happen, you would surely quit doing everything you know in your heart to be wrong and would seek peace more than ever. I've believed that forever. If we actually could see what was going on in the invisible world, if you knew that Jesus was coming in two weeks, you I tell you what, we would live totally different, would we not? Continuing on, be prepared, be holy, and don't give in to the temptation, the impulses of the enemy. Seek the Lord your God with all your heart. Those who will be clean, those who will be holy, I will not forget. I will save them, says the Lord. The armies of the devil are coming with great fury against those who worship me and truly seek me. Pray that I may give you strength so that before the storm comes, I may save you and give you the joy. 
meaning God is going to keep us through these bad times. Listen, I talked about this earlier, about the joy of the Lord, the peace that comes, that the, the Fox's Book of Martyrs, when they're being burned at the stake and they're clapping, and he said, I'll clap if, the, if it's not hurting them. They were clapping as they're on fire, as God is able to keep you even through the worst of times. Continuing on, those that live in the defilement, the med- that meditate upon evil things will have no escape they will not have my protection. I will destroy Babylon, says the Lord, because of the wickedness and the blasphemy of this country. Not only here, but wherever there is sin, I will punish it harshly. Only the righteous will I save, some even out of the midst of the fire. Some say with fear, or some say with compassion through grace. Others say with fear, pulling them from the fire, pulling them from the fire, hating even the garment spotted. Sorry, I was trying to remember that verse in Jude. Uh, that sounds just like that, doesn't it? Sorry, continuing on here. Again, I tell you, a dark cloud is gathering. Lucifer, standing on his black horse, is ready for war. The trumpets of the devil are sounding day and night to all the demons of the deep to be prepared to make war against those who truly live their lives for God. There will be such great turmoil that only few will escape. Those that those that today only carry the name of believer, listen to this. I'm going to read that again. Those that today only carry the name of believer will fight with fury against those who worship me with a clean heart. That is so biblical, isn't it? Though your enemies will be those of your own home. Those who call themselves Christian one day will fight. They will be your enemies because you will, you're will. you not going to be woke enough in the modern Christian community. You don't accept certain lifestyles. You, I'm telling you right now, folks, those some in your own churches, if you attend a church somewhere or wherever, will become your own enemies. Look out. And he's, it's being reminded right here. Continuing on. This is why I have revealed this to you because the days are numbered. I reveal to you, I speak to you, I show you, says the Lord, but many do not want to remember, saying to themselves, it is truly the Lord speaking this. Others have scared for have scared for the moment, but then they forget and never become pure. Many of those who carry the name Christian are overcome by greed, fornication, drunkenness, and the pursuit of wealth. Isn't that true? In this country, the only thing we care about is wealth and greed and the pursuit of our own, you know, stuff like that. We like to carry the name of the Christian though, right? Because a verse a day keeps the devil away. Listen, one this thing here reading about this. I'll tell you a good indicator that somebody is not from the Lord. When they're in modern day in 2000 and and uh, 22, we're in right now, and they get a prophecy from the Lord. And now I read the King James Bible. It's a favorite translation for me. It's what I primarily read uh, 98% of the time. And I love the King James language. But God knows how to speak in our own language today, okay? The Lord doesn't need to say, thus thee, thou, okay? God is not stuck in 1611 King James, all right? So that's just a good indicator that someone's probably talking from their flesh when it sounds like it's coming out of the 1611 King James, okay? Continuing on here. There is no time to lose. The day of destruction and terror is coming soon. The devil is agitated and a great deception is being prepared. But I tell you, do not fear. I have the power to protect those who obey me. You must remember the word of God, for if you will not obey, the day of terror will come and you will suffer together with the wicked and defiled. I will punish all the wickedness of this world and all the sin of this place. Be awake and waiting because if you will not, you will be punished as the wicked and also lose your salvation for your disobedience. Disobedience is punished more than anything, says the Holy Spirit. Pray for your children and stop them from doing worldly things. Tell them that the wrath of God is coming and that they must prepare for that day. Tell them to read the Bible and pray that I may also save them. Now, listen, folks, some of you, you've tried your children. I understand that they're grown. You, you did your, you know, maybe you didn't. It's it, We can't fix the past. And maybe your kids don't want to hear you. But that doesn't mean you can't still pray for them. 
Because even though they won't listen right now, they will remember the words that you said when the time comes and the Lord can revive that in their hearts and bring them back at the right moments. Don't give up on your kids. We share, we tell them what's going on and we warn them and everything, but ultimately they make their own decisions. It doesn't matter if we didn't do the best in the past. We're all failures. The fact is we get our lives right now and the best thing we can do is continue to pray for our children and share with them, you know, and but be tactful, do it the right way. Pray for the spirit of the living God to come upon you before you speak to your children. Continuing, the great day, the day of terror, the day of affliction, of pain, a day of punishment, of Babylon prophesied in the Bible is soon coming, and I will only spare the righteous, says the Lord. I will forgive who I want. I make holy who I want, and I prepare who I want. Judge no one, for mine is the judgment, says the Lord. Each of you judge yourselves. Pray and draw close to me, and if you will obey, I will come to your aid. I will send a chariot of my salvation and take each one of you out in his appointed time. Wow. That's some heavy stuff. And that might be very troubling to some people that are in the once saved, always saved camp. Can do ever do anything? I understand that. But that, I'm just reading what I shared. You need to take that to the Lord, okay? Because God wants us to follow and obey. Does that mean you will never sin? Absolutely not. You, We make mistakes, but there's a difference between willfully living your way and falling and making a mistake, okay? God forgives it when we make mistakes. God helps us when we do things wrong. God is very merciful and forgiving, but there are those people who have decided in their Christian walk that they can do what they want to do and live how they want to live and think that is somehow okay. When the Lord says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's the word of Jesus. I'm not making that up. That's New Testament, okay? Uh, this don't don't get me that this is some Old Testament type talk. No, that's what Jesus said himself. If you love me, keep my commandments. And if you don't, he calls you a liar because you are simply just wanting to carry the name for the benefits, but you don't want to actually follow his word. So your love is a lie because if you truly loved, you would do what he says. Again, I didn't say you'd be perfect. I'm talking about, though, desiring the things of the Lord. If you're struggling with something, it's okay. Tell your Heavenly Father what you're struggling with. He knows you've been struggling. It's all right if you have a problem. I don't care how bad your problem's been. God loves honesty. I believe that with all of my heart. Because the most dangerous thing you can get into right now in these last days, and that is the danger of the double-minded man. I've mentioned this verse before over and over again on the remnant call throughout the years. I'm just going to read it again. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, neither thieves or covetous, nor drunkards or revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Paul says, quit fooling yourself. These people are going in. So if you think that you can just live, I'm a Christian, so I just get drunk and I can drink and do it. The Bible says have a little wine for that, often infirmities. I wish you would study the truth out and understand about the cisterns and how they had to dilute it with a four to ten part dilution of alcohol and wa- and water together, which you wouldn't get drunk off of because of the, uh, the bacterias in their uh, cisterns. And that's why the Paul says, have a little bit of wine for thy often infirmities. And then Solomon says, don't look upon it when it's red, meaning undiluted. I'm not going to take it any farther than that. But being a drunkard is unchristian. Swearing, I don't want to, you know, the Bible says we don't bless and curse out of the same mouth. We need to watch what we say and just understand that God wants us to live his way and you will be happy. Because Paul continues and says, and such were some of you, but you were washed you're sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of your God saying, that's the old you. That's not the new you. This deceiving yourself that there's two, that you can walk this double-minded way. James chapter one, listen to what James says, starting in verse one. 
James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings, my brethren. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Who's had that lately, huh? We all have, right? He says, count it joy. That's different. Knowing this, that trying of your faith works patience. Oh, wait a second. The trials that we are going through are designed to actually help us build patience. Why would that be? Well, maybe because we're coming into the end time and God's preparing us for what's going on. But let patience have its perfect, have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with a wind and tossed. Now listen closely. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord, for a double, uh, it says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double mind. I, it's interesting. If you actually look at the word, what it means, double-minded, it actually means two-spirited. Like you've got two spirits living within you. You know, this good verse, you're trying to follow Satan and the Lord at the same time. And you don't want to do that. Because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. It was like when Elijah, right? When he was at uh, um, with Ahab on Mount Carmel, he says, And Elijah came unto, the, unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If, but if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word because they had been called out in the hypocrisy of their lives. And he says, How long are you going to try to serve the Lord, Yahweh, and Baal at the same time because you've created some brand new religion out here that God doesn't even recognize and you're going to sit here and think that you can worship both. How long? If God's God, then follow him. But if it's Baal, then fine. God's not. That's your choice. It's your freedom, okay? But don't deceive yourselves. James 1.22 says, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self, Right? And a double-minded man is dangerous or woman. But what do we do? What's the cure? How do I, Brother Frank, okay, I hear what you're saying. I'm trapped. I'm stuck. I don't see how to get near out of this. Listen to what James, I love the book of James because James gives the problem and he also gives the remedy. Love it. James chapter four, starting in verse eight, draw nigh to your God and he will draw nigh to you. Isn't that wonderful? God says, It doesn't matter. You've been messed up. You know I want you to walk in my ways. You've lived some double-mindedness. But if you'll draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. He goes on, he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, how do you do that? Well, the answer comes right after it. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. There's some times, folks, we just need to deal with the problem in a very honest, it's time to put the joking away. Verse 10, here's the remedy. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Humble yourselves, prayer, fasting, We know that that's all a part of the humility that God talks about humbling themselves when they would fast and ask and sackcloth and all these things sitting in ashes. They were humbling themselves before the Lord in order to show to to repent and, and ask God to show mercy. And the Lord's saying, if you will just humble yourselves in my sight, I'll lift you up. Stop trying to seek the cares of this world, the fortunes, the the desire, you know, the desires of this world. Start to seek me, and I will lift you up. And here's the kicker. Verse 11, speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. You see, listen you got to stop this nonsense of cutting your brothers and sisters down. This is not of God. This is not the Lord's will. 
God wants us to do the right thing. Stop talking bad about our brothers. Resist it. You hate hearing. Have you ever been around that churchgoer, that person? You know, they maybe you've maybe you've never been to a church, but you've been in, you know whatever that that fellowship. But all they ever have is something bad to say about something else. And the truth is, if all you do is say something bad about other people, that is an immediate flag that you have something wrong in your own life. It goes back to the very Garden of Eden, because when they sinned, what's the first thing they did? They covered up their sin, right, with the fig leaves and all that. And then it began the blame game, right? Eve blames the serpent, you know, Adam blames God. And then Eve, this woman that you gave me, right? So God gets the blame. Eve gets the blame. Eve makes the blame on the serpent. It's all the blame game. So every time somebody is involved in sin, the easiest way to try to appease their guilty conscience is to constantly cut down other people. That's a good sign that you have a problem. Let's deal with the issue by humbling ourselves and doing the right thing. And God will make a change. He will do what we have not been able to do all these years. Ezekiel chapter 33, and I want to close. When I say, when I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trusts in his, on his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousness shall be, shall not be remembered, but for his iniquity, that he hath committed, he shall die for it. Again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die if he turns from his sin and do that which is lawful and right. If the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live and shall not die. None, do you hear that? Of his sins, none, it says that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. What God's saying is, you know what? You, you, if you walk in the ways of the Lord and you turn and you decide you want to walk in your own way, you're in big trouble. The Lord's not going to tolerate that. I'm just telling you honestly. But here's what he says to the wicked, to you, to me, that have messed up. We've tried to follow the Lord. Maybe we got off the path. We, we did the wrong, but we, we say, Lord, forgive me. I want to come back. I want to change. The Lord says, I don't care how wicked you were. If you'll turn from your sin, start doing the things that I ask you to do. I won't remember any of your sins. Not a single one of them will be brought up. Not in, when we get to judgment day, the Lord's not going to say, you know what? You did this, this, and this. You know what? Boy, you better be glad that I was nice to you. No, God says, I'm not even going to bring him up. I'm not even going to bring him up. Because he's going to wash him white as snow. King David walked in the ways of God. And he fell hard off the path with Bathsheba. And not only then... He had her husband killed. He did some serious wrong. But he cried out to the Lord. And God forgave him. Without even a sacrifice, Nathan the prophet said, the Lord has put this thing behind him. And God called him a man after his own heart. You know why? Because when David turned around, All those things in his past, they didn't exist anymore. They were gone. That's what the Lord can do for you and for me and for anybody, no matter how bad we've been, no matter how much we've messed up and how far we've gotten off the path, if we will come back, it'll be as if we had never sinned. That's the God we serve. And he tries to warn us in these last days. Jesus spoke way more about hell than he ever spoke about heaven. Because he knows human nature. And sometimes, as I was trying to remember the quote from Jude, 
Some you got to save with love through compassion. Others you got to save with fear. Pulling them from the fire, hating even the garment spotted. I'm sorry if I misquoted that, please forgive me. But sometimes people just need an old-fashioned Holy Ghost slap upside the head. Meaning the Lord has to just say, you know what, Frank, like he's in back in 1999 to me. When he showed me I was going to die and where I would end up. And I broke. And he offered me another way. Now, I was one of those people that were headed for absolute destruction. And here's the bad thing. I had been told about Jesus. I had been raised in church, but I didn't want any of it. The Lord never gave up on me. And he certainly hasn't given up on you. Folks, we are living in some perilous times. But we are also living in the time the Bible talked about was coming. When even greater works than Jesus will be done. Because that's what the Lord wants. He wants to show his power through his people. But we are in training right now still. And we need to move forward and quickly through this to be useful soldiers in his army. And that army is not the army that's here to fight and take this country back. That's the army that's here to tell a dying world about a risen Savior who has come to forgive them of their sins. And he died, nailed to a cross, and rose again the third day. And he's coming back. And they can have a part of this gift if they will accept in faith this gift of salvation and follow our Heavenly Father's ways that he will bring us through all the way to the end. And I'll tell you what, that is our marching orders for this last hour. Don't forget, your God loves you. He warns you because he cares for you. He chastens those who he loves. So if you're not being chastened, be careful. Be careful. And that doesn't mean that there's always going to be times of chastening. There's times of no chastening, but the Lord does chasten. And you know what? It's okay because as as the word of the Lord said through the apostle James, that these things were to give us patience, patience, that we would be ready when the Lord comes again. This is Brother Frank on the Remnant Call saying to everybody, good night and shalom. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound it on the mountains. Blow a trumpet in Zion, for the day of the Lord is come. Blow a trumpet in Zion.